Hello, brothers and sisters of Christ. Um, the last study we did was about titles, uh, religious titles for men. And I got two thumbs down on that right away. And I know who I got two thumbs down from. I got thumbs down from, from people that are about feelings and opinions, church fathers, traditions of men. And they're not holding this book in a high enough place as they ought to hold this book. Mm -hmm. Brothers and sisters Christ, I've been dealing with people online. First, I want to say hello. <laughs> it's a good morning here. Uh, we had some rain yesterday, praise the Lord. We definitely need some rain. So we had our rain yesterday. It was supposed to be raining all weekend, but it looks like it's going to be clear skies today. But we got some rain, praise the Lord. I pray that you guys are doing good and that you're staying in the Word of God. You're, you're praying. You're reading the book every day. You're praying every day. And you're trying your best to be a light to this wicked world, brothers and sisters Christ. I pray for that. Um, last, back to what I was saying, last night I was, was last night I was dealing with some people, and then this morning I was dealing with some people online. Um, I put out the Bible. I'm working on trying to put out a better version of uh, What's the Difference? Advanced Manuscript Evidence by Peter Ruckman. I had that out, and I had a, someone else did a copy, put it up there, and it freezes in one spot. It's a lot longer than it should be because uh, it freezes for like an hour or something like that, 30 minutes. Then it skips and this. It's just a poor rendering of it. Um, but I got a lot of people coming on there, and they're attacking the Word of God. And that's all I'm trying to help you with, Brother Sister Christ, is this is our final authority, that you're lifting this up. I've said this so many times, Brother Sister Christ. If I'm wrong doesn't mean this is wrong. This is always right. This is perfect. It means I'm not lined up to it. And when it seems like I'm right, don't go worshiping me, respecter of persons, and holding me up to some platform. No, no, no. People love to do that, especially with people online and people in Babel buildings. And when you start holding that person up as the authority, you start out by saying, he's got to be right on with this, so you hold them as the final authority. And then what happens when they stray from this and go to this direction? You go with them. Because you stop holding this. Where I'm right, I'm not right. It's because this Bible's right. And where I'm wrong is because I'm not lined up with this book. Okay? And I've been dealing with people on their fight in that video saying, you're just an idolatry. It's just worldly idolatry. And you know what I said back to them, brothers says Christ? I, t I mean, it doesn't mean much. I showed scripture because a, a lot of the people that attacked that video, here's the amazing part. They claim to be Christians. They like to claim that title for themselves. Okay? They're not Christians according to the Word of God. Okay? They claim to be part of the body of Christ. They claim to be brothers and sisters in Christ. And they're attacking it. So I quote scripture about how important God's Word is. And then that one guy made the comment about idolatry. And I went back and I took him back to Adam and Eve. I took him back to the very beginning. And showed him how God gave a perfect command. His word is perfect. He gave a perfect command. And what happened? Eve corrupted it. She added to it. God gave a perfect command. Don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The day that thou eatest of it, thou shalt surely die. So he gave a command of what not to do. And he gave a command saying, this is going to be the consequences. So what did Eve do? She corrupted it. She added to it, we're not supposed to eat it, nor are we supposed to touch it. God never said not to touch it. So she corrupted God's word and made it her own. And then comes the serpent, Satan, comes along. And Satan comes along and says, let's just do away with it completely. He just calls it, he calls it a lie and just does away with it completely. Okay? Uh, ye not, yea, hath God said... Got Eve to corrupt this, what God said, and then he said, Oh, God's lying. That's not true. Ye shall not surely die. Because he knows in the day that ye eat that of, ye shall be as God's and own good and evil. The bottom line, brothers and Christ, is people want, they don't want this to be their final authority. It's the King James Bible. Okay, authorized version. Nobody want, they don't want this to be their final authority, brothers and Christ. They want this to be the final authority. And that's of Satan. Okay. We did that study on words to no profit because there's brethren that are arguing over things that aren't worth arguing over. And you've got the lost world trying to attack you and trying to deceive you because this isn't their final authority. 
And the last one we did is about uh, titles of religious titles of men. And we talked about that saying, what's the most religious, most, what's the titles that are important? The names and titles that are important. Your name is important if you're saved and born again. The Bible says in Revelation, your name is written in the book of life. Your name is written down and your name is important. Right. Your name, Philip Fraser Newton, is written in the book of life. Okay. I am sealed into the day of redemption. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. But I told you, and I promised the brethren that we'll do a study on the hymn that's called Jesus, Name Above All Names. We sung it the last time. Okay, I'll, I'll sing the first half because it's going to be a long study because what we're going to do, Brother Jesus Christ, is I'm trying to keep you in the habit of this is the, this is the final authority. This is the final authority. You sing a hymn. When's the last time you've taken a hymn that sounds good, that makes you feel good? How? When's the last time you took that hymn and compared it to the scriptures and make sure it lines up to the scriptures? Well, I can't do that because I love this hymn so much, and if I line it up to the scriptures, it might not line up with the scriptures. And then I'd have to let it go. Yes, you would, brother, says Christ, if you love the Lord and you love his word. Remember what Jesus said, if a man love me, keep my commandments. If a man love me, he will keep my words. And my Father will love him <coughs> and will come and make our abode with him. Okay? Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. It's about pleasing God, not yourself. And today we got a lot of self pleasers. Why do we have a lot of, I believe, why do we have a lot of division in the body of Christ right now? Is we got people that are desperately trying to please God. Some of us fail. I failed. I failed the Lord. I failed the brethren before. But we do our best. Our heartfelt desire is we want to please God. Show us, Lord, how to please you. And then you get brethren that once had that attitude going back to the world and being self-pleasers. It's all about pleasing this man right here, not the Lord God Almighty. It's pleasing this man, pleasing this man. I like to do things this way because it makes me feel good. Okay. So what I did was, is with the Lord's help, we decided we we're going to go through. Uh, I've only got the first part. This is only going to be part one. It's going to be a long study, so I'm not going to be turning to the scriptures because we're going to be hitting tons of scriptures. Pause the video and turn to the scriptures. Okay, please turn to the scriptures. Um, that's how I learn things better, and it's how you can stay focused. Think about this, because some of us, I'm one of them. Some of us that if I'm just sitting there like this, trying to listen to somebody, my mind can wander. Okay. You look at a man who is addicted to Hollywood movies, TV shows, video games. We could be going through a Bible study and someone says something or we read something that makes me think of something else and my mind just starts to wander a little bit. I used to do that a lot before I was saved. My mind would wander. God helped me rein it in by God's grace and God's mercy. But what helps is if I actually turn and follow along. A, you're making sure that that person that's preaching is actually reading from this. But it also helps you stay focused. Okay? A lot of people think, well, uh, I cannot turn or anything, and uh, I can just sit there and everything. Or I can do something else, because some people have multiple screens for computers. So they're watching the video over here, and they're doing something over here. I can multitask. If it's the first time you're watching a Bible study, you need to have this open. And I tend to try to have it open almost every time I listen to a Bible study uh, as best I can. There's sometimes that I've listened to Bible studies sitting out on the deck. Okay. I have the Bible with me in case I need to flip it open and say, wait a minute, I don't remember that. Pause, pause the uh, study because I like to turn Bible studies into audio studies and listen outside. There's nothing wrong with listening to uh, turn it into an audio study and listening to it while you're gardening and doing physical work. But the first time you come across the study, maybe even the first few times, you need to be having this Bible open. You need to be following along. Okay? That way you're getting the Word of God and you're trying your best to hide it here. So it's not just up here, it's down here. And you can apply it to your life. So Jesus' name above all names, what's the most important title? Now this hymn does not have every title and description of God in the Bible. Okay? And I know this hymn has different variations. But the one I have, I decide I'm going to go through it, I'm going to compare it to the scriptures, and today we're going to do that together. Okay. 
So I'm going to read the first stanza, or read the first stanza. We sung the hymn before, but these are hymns. Jesus, name above all names. Jesus, name above all names. We're going to get into that. Beautiful Savior, glorious Lord, Emmanuel, God is with us. Blessed Redeemer, living word. That's the first stanza. So this, that's what we're going to be going through. Okay. Now... First one says Jesus. Jesus is the name, brothers says Christ. Today they have tried everything they can to do away with Jesus. But if you turn to Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Where do we get this Jesus is the name? And as a side note, I remember a brother in Christ, as you're turning there, as I remember a brother in Christ that... Uh, he got so zealous and so prideful and so ego and arrogant that he came out and he tried to do a study saying that his name shouldn't have been Jesus, it should have been Emmanuel. And remember what I said about people who don't hold the Word of God as their final authority, number one? They start worshiping the man and trusting the man that he's right on with this. And over time that man comes up here, the Bible comes down here, and the man goes off in this direction. And guess what direction the people go? They go the direction of that man because they're followers of that man. This no longer has the preeminent place in their life. God's Word. But this man came out and said that uh, Mary and Joseph were in sin for naming the baby Jesus when they were supposed to name the baby Emmanuel. He made out as if they were commanded to name the baby Emmanuel. And these two sets of verses that we're going to read, he purposely, purposely left out. I don't believe it was an accident. He purposely left. That's what happens when you get prideful and arrogant. You start messing with the book. You purposely leave things out. You start adding. You start subtracting. You start thinking you're the final authority. Okay? But what did the Bible say? Was uh, Joseph and Mary in sin for naming the child Jesus when it should have been Emmanuel? Well, it's easily debunked through the scriptures. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord. Now we talked about in the Old Testament, this is God manifest in the flesh. An angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord, that man. Okay, God had a physical body in the Old Testament. He dealt with mankind through his body. Okay. And we're going to get to that verse about there's one me between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. God's always been dealing with mankind all the way back from the, to the beginning, Adam and Eve, through his flesh, through his body. He had an incorruptible body in the Old Testament. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh, which we're reading about here, how he came in the likeness of sinful flesh, God the Father. But we said, but while he thought on these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared unto him in his dream. It's a dream. He didn't physically appear there. He's in, he's in Mary. But he appears to him in a dream. How does this work? Great is the mystery of godliness. I can't explain how everything works. Great is the mystery of godliness. Okay? But I believe this is Jesus Christ coming to Joseph in a dream. God manifest in the flesh. Okay? But this is a dream. Saying, Joseph, thou son of David... Fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. Not Emmanuel, not Yeshua, not Yahashua. And Jehovah is another name for God, absolutely. But they were to call him Jehovah. What are they were supposed to commanded to call him? Jesus. What's the number one name that they try to get away from in this world today, Brother Jesus Christ? All organized religions, what's the number one name that they really try to do away with or downplay to the point where it's almost nothing? Jesus. That's what the world hates. For he shall save his people from their sins. Could that be a, a reason why they want to downplay it? 
I don't want to be saved from my sins. I love my sins. I want to keep my sins. And today, we're going to get into it a little bit. The biggest deception is you can get saved and keep your sins. You can get saved without repenting. You don't have to give the old man at the cross. You don't have to give your life to Jesus Christ at the cross. The old man doesn't have to be dead and buried. That's one of the greatest deceptions in almost every false religion out there. It doesn't have to be repenting. Right? You can keep your sins. Uh, the consequences of your sins are... We'll, we'll say Jesus paid for your consequences of your sin, therefore you got a free pass to sin all you want. Right? Why do they not like the name Jesus? Because he came to save people from their sins. Satan hates that because he wants mankind, he likes mankind being destroyed. He likes you going to hell. That's Satan. Luke, turn to Luke 1, chapter, chapter 1, verse 26. What happened on Mary's side? Okay, remember that preacher I'm talking about, he taught, oh, it should have been Emmanuel, and they were in sin. What about Mary? Maybe Joseph was in sin, but it says there he was commanded by God Almighty himself, through the angel of the Lord, to name the baby Jesus. Luke chapter 1, verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at, at this saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. Once again, not all these other terms that you had. Some of them are Bible titles for God, but they're not as that they're not the name that he was to have. Why? Because because um, Emmanuel isn't the name that's above all names. And we're getting into the next part. The name that is above all names. Is Emmanuel the name that's above all names? No, it isn't. Is Jehovah the name that's above all names? No, it isn't. And then they had to make up names because they don't want Jesus, so they want Yahashua or Yeshua because they don't want Jesus. And for some of you, brothers of Christ, when you look into it, how'd they get Yahashua? I still wonder how they got it. It's man's, man's way of doing it. They made him up. Okay? The New Testament, where we get the name Jesus, is, is Greek to Hebrew. And there's a movement saying, or not Hebrew, Greek to English. That's how we get Jesus. It comes from Greek to English. And somehow there's a movement out there that says that the New Testament was originally written in Hebrew. And somehow got translated from Hebrew to Greek. And then from Greek, uh, if you look at the history, Greek to Latin, which was a messed up, and then Greek to English. That's a lie. The New Testament was never written in Hebrew. So what they did was they made up their own translation of the New Testament in Hebrew. Okay? That's how they get the Yahashua and uh, Yeshua. And all. if you actually look into Yeshua and Yahashua, all it means is Joshua saves. You go back to Jericho. God used Joshua to, to give Ju the Jewish people victory. Absolutely. And some people teach that Joshua is a type of Christ. Uh, he's, you know, but Joshua doesn't save anybody today. It's Jesus that saves. We're going to find that out. The next, next line in the uh, stanza in the hymn is name above all names. So Jesus is the name that's biblical that lines up with the book. Once again, you have to have a foundation. If there, we don't have the same foundation, there's no point in talking. So this, like I said, these videos are for Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women out there, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Right. Name above all names. Turn to Acts chapter 4, verse 10. Acts chapter 4, verse 10. Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand before you whole. They just healed a man. The name of who? Jesus Christ. 
A lot of times, Christ is added and it's part of his name. It's not just Jesus, it's Jesus Christ. Right? Are you in Christ? Are you part of the body of Christ? Jesus Christ. Right? Verse 11, This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name. What's the name? Jesus Christ. We just read that. For there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. None other name. Oh no, it's supposed to be Emmanuel. No, it isn't. It's Jesus. One of God's titles is Emmanuel. One of Je Jesus is God. Therefore, one of Jesus' titles is Emmanuel. But it's not the name by where, whereby we are saved. It's Jesus Christ. And today this world, especially in these last days, are really trying to do away with it, brothers and Christ, and we need to stand firm to it. It's Jesus Christ. That's the name, and that's the name that's above all names. Turn to Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Let this mind be in you. Okay? Let this mind be in you. Remember what Paul said, we're supposed to be of the same mind... This is our same mind. This is our, we're all supposed to be of the same foundation when it says be of the same mind. Of the same judgment. We're to use this to judge. Only, only when you have a proper foundation, and everybody has that same proper foundation, can judgment go about. Okay? We're supposed to be of the same mind and of the same judgment, striving together as the body of Christ. Is the body of Christ as a whole doing that today? No. Today... We're not on the same mind. We're not all on the same page as they as I keep saying. We're not all on the same page. Everyone's got their own feelings and opinions getting in the way. The flesh is getting in the way. Uh, traditions of men, church fathers, traditions of men, uh, covetousness, which is idolatry, worldliness, comes in, gets in the way. The body of Christ is not in good condition. But the Bible says in these last days there's a falling away. Okay. We've got studies on that. There's a falling away today. Okay. Let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Another, another attack, attack on the Godhead is the Trinity. Trinity teaches that Jesus and God the Father are not equal. Jesus is not God the Father. God the Father is not the Son. They turn the Son into a separate God, God the Son. We did this in another study where we talked about it. The Bible says Son of God. Of shows connection to God. There's a connection. They're equal. You take away the of and you flip it around and put God before and say God the Son. You make the Son out to be a separate God apart from the Father. Thought it not robbery to be equal in other words, whatever title God has, He has. Whatever glory God gets, He gets. They're equal. They're one and the same. The distinction is, is God the Father is the soul, Jesus is the body. The Son of God is the body. Soul, body, they are connected, they are one. They, they're equal. That's, that's the other studies we've already done. Thought it not robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh. He gave up his incorruptible body. God the Father gave up his incorruptible body in the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord, an angel of the Lord, and he came in the likeness of sinful flesh. He came in the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. That's where you get the likeness of the sinful flesh. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, not Yeshua, once again, not Yahashua, not Jehovah, not Emmanuel, but at the name of Jesus Every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. At the great white throne, brother says Christ, those who reject Jesus Christ 
Those who reject doing things God's way and coming to God on His terms, which we're going to be talking about, it's going to be a long study. That's why, that's why I slow down greatly trying to turn. Pause the video and turn. But they don't want to come to God on God's terms. They're going to be standing there, and they're going to have to kneel before God Almighty, Jesus Christ, God the Father, manifest in the flesh, sitting on the throne. There's only one throne, and, and it's a great white throne. And they're going to be judged, and they're going to have to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord God Almighty. Today, the, the hardcore Trinitarians, oh, Jesus isn't God the Father. Someday, if you don't repent and get back to line, let's say you are saved and you got messed up with traditions, if you don't get back to lining up with this and believing in the Godhead of the King James Bible, okay, there is no capital T Trinity as a title for God in the Bible. There's no lowercase Trinity as a description of God in the Bible. So it didn't come from the Bible. You need to get to the back to the Bible. Okay? As uh, Peter Ruckman always said, get back to the Bible or get back to the jungle. Okay? This is our final authority. Okay? When you get up there, you're going to have to confess that Jesus Christ is God the Father. Everyone will. All the lost world will. He is God fully and completely. And then God's going to say, depart from me, you curse into everlasting fire. Ye that work iniquity, I never knew you. Boom. But everyone has to. And what's the name, brother says Christ? It's Jesus. It's Jesus. So does that line up with the, with the hymn? Yes, it does. Jesus is the name that's above all names. Right? Next part in the stanza, it says, beautiful Savior. Okay, turn to 2 Corinthians 5.18. 2 Corinthians 5.18 we read, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. You say, well, what does that have to do with beautifully? Okay, Savior, he reconciled himself by Jesus Christ. Only through Jesus Christ can, be, we, can we be reconciled to God. There's only one way to get saved. Okay. Uh, turn to Romans chapter 10, verse 15, but the ministry of reconciliation. Romans chapter 10, verse 15. And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. How beautiful are them that preach the gospel of peace. One of the pieces of armor is the feet shod with the preparation of peace. What's one of the number one reasons why we're still here, brother says Christ? When you get saved, why don't you just get caught up like that? Why are we still here? Because we're here to lead other people to sell to Jesus Christ, so Jesus Christ can save them the way He saved us. We're supposed to be a light through the life that we're living. We're supposed to lead people to Christ by the life that we're living, not just our words, but also our words, through our words, our testimony, preaching the gospel. And through the life that we live. Okay? The problem we have today is we got a lot of people that don't live a life of Christ. They don't have that light. But they're trying to preach Jesus, a Jesus Christ. And those, there's some that are saved that their light is just flickering. And when the time comes up, they'll try to preach the gospel. But you need to have both. You need to be a bright, shining light to this world. Because you live according to this book right here, to God's commands. Came across, I got, I got into it with somebody recently that... She believes that she's no longer under the laws of God. Uh, she's no, if you're truly saved, you're no longer under the law of sin and death. But she made it out like she's no longer under the commandments of God. I'm no longer under the commandments of God. I've been freed. I can do whatever I want, whenever I want. I can live how I want. I can believe what I want. I'm the final authority. When you get saved, you're not free from the commandments of God. You're still under the commands. And we did that study. I can't remember if it was Romans 8 that talks about, I think it's Romans 8, that talks about that we've been saved from the law of sin and death. We're no longer under the law of sin and death, but we're still under the law of sin. In this life, when we're still stuck in this body, because we're only two-thirds redeemed, your soul's redeemed, your spirit's redeemed, but this body isn't redeemed, we're still under the law of sin. There's still physical consequences to sin down here. But the law of sin and death, because death gets dropped, God saved us from. But if you keep reading, it says we're now under the law of God. A lot of the easy people, when I did that study, they hated it. 
They attacked me. They were vicious. Because I showed that you don't get out from being under God's commands. He's still our commander-in-chief. He's our capital K king. King gives orders. You obey. He gives commands. The people obey. Lord of lords. A lord gives commands. And the people obey. Okay. We're under the law of God, and it's also called the law of the spirit of life, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus comes in and says, okay, I'm going to command you. Remember the scripture that says there's no greater love than this, the man laid down his life for his friend? The greatest love that God ever showed to us is that he came in the likeness of sinful flesh and then gave his life at the cross. He did it for you. He did it for me. There's no greater love than this. But people don't like to keep reading because if you keep reading, it says, Ye are my friends if, the Bible if, you do whatsoever I command you. Oh, but when you get saved, you're not under the commands of God anymore. Yes, you are. Anyone who's truly saved knows that. I'm under God's commands. Now that he saved me, he starts cleaning up my life. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Put no wicked thing before thine eyes. Drunkenness is a sin. No fornicating. And so on and so forth. The Bible says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. It's God's commands that you're hiding in your heart and you're doing your best to obey them. And the Bible teaches us, you fail, what happens? You repent, you forsake, and you get back to your walk with the Lord, brother says Christ. The Bible says, um, if any man come after me, he must deny himself, repent, pick up his cross daily, forsake, and get back to your walk with the Lord and follow me. Okay? He is faithful to forgive. You read that in the book of John. 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John talks about how he's faithful to forgive. You confess your sins, present tense, and he's faithful to forgive you and get you back on the right path. That's how God, God chastens you as he would a child. But here it says, getting back to the study, it says, The feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. How beautiful. Remember what we just said? Beautiful Savior. Jesus is the Savior. He's the mediator between God and man. There's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Jesus saves. You have to go through him, but you've got to come to him on his terms. Turn to John chapter 3, verse 17. And we're going to talk about his terms. John 3, 17. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved through Jesus Christ through his through his sacrifice on the cross Luke 147 we read Luke chapter 1 verse 47 we read and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my savior God my savior no Jesus remember Jesus and the father aren't one according to the pagan trinity God 1 Corinthians 8, 6 says there's only one God, the Father. It says, God, my Savior. The Bible says that feed the church of God, which he had purchased with his own blood. God the Father purchased the church with his own blood. Get a little ahead of myself, but when you get saved, what goes back to you to, oh, we're no longer under the command of God. I am free. But what does the Bible teach? The Bible says that when you get saved, you're bought with a price. Know ye not that you're not your own? You're bought with a price. Feed the church of God which he had purchased with his own blood. You are bought and paid for. You are not your own. You belong to God. He owns you. But that's not popular today. I want to be free, free to sin, free to do whatever I want and live however I want, believe however I want. And that's what they think salvation, it's a false salvation. They're on their way to hell. Right? When you truly get saved, you're now under the command of God. You put yourself under the command of God. The old man is dead and buried with Jesus Christ. The new man is raised with him. And that new man is under Jesus Christ, under his authority. Under the word of God. Like they said, oh, you, treat, you idolize this book. No, I'm obeying my God and Savior. When he says, keep my words. You love me? Keep my words. I'm obeying my Savior. I'm obeying my Lord and Savior, God Almighty, that created me. I'm pleasing Him, not this. 
Sometimes I fail him and turn back to trying to please this sometimes. But my heartfelt desire, and I pray it's the same for you, brothers and Christ, is that I want to please God. And where you fail him, repent, forsake, and get back to pleasing God again. And what pleases God? For this is the whole duty of man. What is the whole duty of man? Fearing God. Because what does Satan do? He takes the fear of God away. We talked about this in... Um, we talked about uh, Adam and Eve. What would Satan do? First, he questioned God's word. Yea, hath God said. Then, then he took the, uh, the commandment of God. He questioned it. Then he took the fear of God away. Okay? If you fear God, it's by, it goes hand in hand. Oftentimes, if you fear God, you're going to keep his commandments. If you don't fear God, what happens? You, don't, you stop keeping his commandments. Fearing God and keeping His commandments, this is the whole duty of man. That's what pleases God. Fearing God and keeping His commandments. One of our commandments, the number one commandment for today is obey the gospel. One of the other commandments we're said, we're talking about the ministry of reconciliation. We're called to be a light to the world, and we're called to preach the gospel and preach our testimony to all those around us. Have you done that, brothers and Christ? Do you have that, that attitude? And my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. There's some people that when God saves them, they can't keep their mouth shut. They go and tell everyone, God saved me. He can save you. You just have to come and repent and believe in His Son. And the sacrifice on the cross, the finished work on the cross. And they just get so excited, they just, their testimony. This is how God saved me. And if God can save this man right here, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall save me from this body of death? If Jesus can save this man right here, he can save any of you. It's a command to preach the gospel. It's a command in the Bible that we're supposed to be a light into the world. These are commands. But today they try to make them out to be suggestions. It's just suggestions. Oh, it's just a suggestion. You don't really have to. I came across a professing Christian that said, I don't, I'm not called, that's just a calling and I'm not called to preach the gospel. My eyes got wide after I got saved and learned from the... We're all called. You get saved, you're called to be a living testimony and you can and there to be a verbal testimony. We're all called to witness for Jesus Christ. Something wasn't right there. There was a different spirit there. It wasn't the Holy Spirit. Philippians 3.20. Turn to Philippians 3.20. For our conversation... Philippians 3.20. For our conversation is in heaven... From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We look to the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. That goes back to that blessed hope again, brothers Jesus Christ. Remember, we're only two-thirds redeemed. Our soul is redeemed, our spirit's redeemed, but this body of flesh isn't. God saved us on the cross. He saved our soul, He saved our spirit. But this body of flesh hasn't been saved yet. He's going to come again and save us completely and fully at the catching away of the body of Christ. He'll either call you up in death, you'll die, and your soul and spirit go to heaven, or he'll call the whole body up at the catching away. Are you looking to heaven? For our conversation is in heaven. Brother Jesus Christ, have you forgotten that our rewards in heaven is what's important? Brother Jesus Christ, this isn't our home. The Bible says we're supposed to be ambassadors for Jesus Christ. You know what an ambassador is? He's someone who's had to leave his home and go preach in a foreign land. Our home is up there, brothers and sisters of Christ, not down here. We're in a foreign land. Being ambassadors for Jesus Christ, part of the ministry of reconciliation, trying to lead people to the truth. Trying to preach truth, trying to lead people to the truth, trying to get the other ambassadors, people who get saved, to hold on to the truth and don't let it go. Don't become part of the falling away. Be a light to this world. Don't start blending into the world. Don't conform to the world. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You're not to conform to the world. You're not to love the world. Love not the world, neither the things in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. We're, this home right here, some people say it's your home away from home. Yeah, this isn't really my home. It's just where I dwell. It's a blessing from the Lord that He's allowed me to live here. But this isn't my home. My home is up there. And it's up there that I'm preparing, a, that Jesus is preparing a place for us. I want to say it right. Jesus is preparing a place for us. 
In my father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again and receive you unto me. That's what we're looking for, Jesus to call us home. Some of us, sometimes we get, we, you can mess up your life greatly and go, Lord, I just want to come home, I've made a mess. Sometimes we get so tired and vexed by this wicked world. We get tired of all the fighting. Fight, we're supposed to fight. Remember, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Sometimes that can get wearing. Fighting this lost world. Trying to preach truth to people that oftentimes don't want the truth. You want a good thing to read? Go read Jeremiah. Right? Jeremiah tried to preach the truth and only two people listened. But his whole life amounted to only two people at present tense that listened. And then you had um, later on um, Daniel read his, 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 the, his writings and he learned from him from Jeremiah and believed the words of God that was being spoke through Jeremiah. But sometimes, especially in these last days, it feels like men in ministry, sometimes it feels like, are we really helping people? We get tired, we get weary, and we want to go to our real home. But remember, we're supposed to be earning rewards in heaven. Our conversation is in heaven. In other words, we're focused on pleasing God. Where's Jesus Christ at right now? The name that is above all names, beautiful Savior. Where's Jesus Christ right now? He's in heaven preparing a place for us. Where's our eyes supposed to be? On heaven. This is how we get rewards in heaven. This is how we please God. But sometimes we take our eyes off Jesus Christ. We're not looking, looking for that blessed hope anymore. And there's some brethren that have turned their back on that. They don't believe in it anymore. They don't love the appearing of our great God and Savior. Be careful of good words and fair speeches. Remember, your words and your actions need to line up. And these people will say, oh, no, 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 I, still I don't believe in the imminent return of Jesus Christ, but I still love his, his return. Then why are you putting it off? He's not coming back for another five or ten years. That's not someone who loves the imminent return of Jesus, not the imminent, that loves his return. That's someone who doesn't want him to come back right now. I'm having too much fun right now. I love my life right now. I love my new home. They start making this home down. I'm sorry, not the Bible. I'm pointing at the Bible. They're making this down here. This is their home. And they forget it's not their home. Their home is up there. And they put it off. And these people, they're looking for that man of sin, the son of perdition. They're looking for the mark of the beast. They're looking for the one world order. They're looking for the worldwide famine. They're looking for the worldwide economic collapse. They're looking at what goes on in the world, and they're looking for the time of Jacob's trouble. That's not someone who loves his appearing. That's not someone who believes in the pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away the body of Christ. That's somebody who's turned their back on it. What are we supposed to be looking for? What does the Bible command us to look for? We're supposed to be looking, present tense, for that blessed hope. Okay? For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Who's our Savior? Jesus Christ. You'll learn that, what does Jesus Christ do? He keeps saving. He keeps saving. He saved me at salvation, he's done, right? Oh, no, no, no. He saved me at the cross. At salvation, I say at salvation. He saved me at the cross. So he's done saving me. Oh, no, no. He saved me so much in my life as a Christian. And he's going to be saving me from this wicked world someday. Whether he calls me home in death, or he calls me home in life, the catching away of the body of Christ. How about you, brother, sister Christ? How many of you have testimonies that he saved you in this life after the cross? You've made a mess of your life, you've made some bad decisions, you've gone through some hard times, and God carried you through those hard times. He keeps saving. It doesn't, start, it doesn't end at the cross. God is always saving us from ourselves, and from this wicked world. And we're supposed to be looking for the, the ultimate saving that we're looking for greatly is for God to call us home, our real home. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3. Beautiful Savior. Oh yeah. It's going to be a beautiful thing when we get called home. It's going to be glorious. It's going to be amazing. New body. This corrupt, corruption shall put on incorruption. This mortality shall put on immortality. And we're going to go up. It's going to be a glorious thing. It's going to be beautiful. 
1 Timothy 2, 3. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. God our Savior? Yeah, God the Father saved us through His Son, Jesus Christ. Through His body. Beautiful Savior. Turn to 2 Timothy 1.10. 2 Timothy 1.10 But it is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Salvation is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Are you in Christ Jesus our Lord? Go back to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. I know we were just there, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3, but... 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. We read, For there is one capital G God. It's the Father. We read that in uh, 1 Corinthians 8, 6. There is one capital G God. For there is one God, and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Now, brothers and Christ, I'm going to take some time. I know brethren out there that have gotten really... They've gotten away from preaching the gospel. They really have. And I remember a brother once that he, was, he had an amazing study, talking about what's going on in the world, relating it to the Bible. And when he came across the gospel, he started fumbling all over himself when it came to trying to preach verses in the Bible about the gospel. And he just kept fumbling, couldn't get a full scripture out. <clears throat> and then at the end, he gave up. And you know what he said? He said, uh, I have a salvation message on this channel. Just go watch the salvation message. Brothers, this is Christ. He was, he had, if, if there was a lost person still watching up to that point, he had that hooks in him. He got him interested in the subject that he was talking about. And this is your chance to preach the gospel to him. And he failed miserably. Be careful of brethren that when the gospel comes up, they can't take five minutes out of the study that they're, that they're preaching to preach the gospel. Be careful. Brother says Christ, why do I preach salvation to saved along with the lost? To remind you of who? I'm sorry, to remind you of why you got saved. Why you needed to get saved. Who it is that saved you. And who it is that you serve. Right? In these last days we have the falling away. Um, in... Um, Let's see if I can remember Isaiah. And what and Isaiah, Isaiah is talking about how Israel, what would Israel do? Over time, they forgot the God of their salvation. They forgot the God that brought them out of Egypt. They forgot the God that saved them from the Philistines. They forgot the God that saved them from this, that saved them from that. They forgot the God of their salvation. And in these last days, the Bible talks about there's a falling away. Why do I preach the gospel to save sinners along with professing saved along with the lost? Because there's some of us that are starting to forget the God of our salvation. And salvation starts at when we go through, we're going to go through salvation. Everything, every step of salvation to finding God's grace, it starts before God saves you and it continues in your life clear to the catching away of the body of Christ. It doesn't stop. But for some people, it's stopping. Why? Because they're forgetting the God of their salvation. That's why you always take time, brother, sister Christ, to preach the gospel, which I'm going to do here. Repentance. And then I'm also going to apply it to our lives as a Christian. So for those who are already saved, oh, I've heard this before, hear it again. I love hearing the gospel. I love hearing the gospel. I love when people, when brethren preach the gospel, the true plan of salvation found in here. Okay. I've had some people mock all oh, their steps to finding the to getting saved. That's <laughs> not saved. That's not true. Yes, it is. If you skip any one of these steps, God will not save you. And we're gonna go through it. Repentance. What's the first step? Repentance. Acknowledging that there is a hell and that you're going there. But why are you going there? Because you've sinned against an almighty righteous God that's gonna judge you one day. And one sin puts you under the law of sin and death. 
send you to hell. Just one sin. And these people, brothers and Christ, we know it. I know it. When you first get saved, God starts to clean up your life. And how many of us looked at our life and God opened our eyes, gave us Bible eyes, you know? And we looked at our life and we realized just how wicked. We thought we were wicked. Oh, yeah, I'm wicked. I'm just this wretched man. I'm just so wicked. When I got saved and God opened my eyes to everything around me, that's when I let, wow, I was 50 times worse than I thought. Oh, Lord, we got some cleaning to do. Yep. Please, Lord, help me. And we had a lot of cleaning to do in my life. Okay. These people that think that, that yeah, I'm a sinner. I, I'm not, I haven't done everything right, but I'm not that bad. When they get to Jesus Christ, the great white throne, and stand beside him, they have that billboard that says, the, I remember that gospel track from Chick Publication, has like a billboard that says, this is your life. They play a movie, this is your life. When the movie's done, you're going to look and go, wow, I was wicked. I was filthy. I was no good. But by then, it's too late. That's why getting saved now is important. Not then, now. Okay. Repentance. Turn to 1 Corinthians 7.10. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. To salvation. See, people say, oh, repentance comes after you get saved. This says it comes before. What, who are we supposed to listen to? This? Or the, man's words. The world's opinions and feelings. What the world wants. No, we're supposed to listen to this. What does God's word say? For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. Repentance comes before salvation. Not to be repented of, but the sorrows of the world worketh death. You have to have sorrow in your heart towards God for your personal sins. Does that end at the cross, brother says Christ? No. It's a lifelong thing. Every time I fail the Lord, every time I stray from this book and start giving into the flesh, start giving the peer pressure to the world, and start doing things the world's way, what do I have to do? i got to come back to the God and repent. Did I lose my salvation? No. I'm not saying you lose your salvation. When you get truly saved and born again, the Bible says you are sealed unto the day of redemption. But there's, you're still under the law of sin, and there's still consequences for sin in this life. You need to keep coming to God constantly and asking for forgiveness when you sin. Present tense. Past tense sins washed away. Present tense sins, you need to ask God for forgiveness. You do. Mm -hmm. But it's godly sorrow for your personal sins. Someone once said, well, what's the difference? So, if someone comes and says, I'm a sinner, versus someone who comes and goes, I'll say this, I'm a sinner, you're a sinner, we're all sinners. That's one person. Another person comes and goes, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Well, I don't see a difference. I think it's the same. Really? You don't see a difference? One is godly sorrow, the other man's just stating a fact. If I come to you, if I come to you and say, I'm wearing a hat, I'm just stating a fact. Now if I take this off, because you come to some, you, sometimes you can come into some guy's house and there's some traditions of men are thinking that it's really rude to have a hat on inside. If you come in and go, oh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have been wearing that hat inside, I am so sorry. I was wearing a hat. I'm so sorry. There's a difference, brothers and sisters of Christ. There's a lot of people that come with these false gospels, easy believism. They come and say, I'm a sinner. But all it is is them stating a fact. It's up here. They're just stating a fact. They're not coming to God broken and having sorrow for their wretched life, the life that they're living. It's wretched. It's sinful. It's wicked. They're on their way to hell. They're without God and without hope in the world, the Bible says. We were once without God and without hope in the world. They are without. Someone who's lost is without God and without hope in the world. Sin separates us from our Creator. Where's the sorrow in that? It needs to be there. Godly sorrow. 2 Peter 3.9 Okay. Someone says, oh, God just doesn't want to save anybody then. Because you have people that have that attitude, brothers, is Christ. We have a testimony. God loves us. Loves us that get saved. He loved the world past tense at the cross. 
He wants to see people get saved, but the ones that complain and whine, God just doesn't want anybody to get saved. If that's how it's got to be, then God just, no, they don't want to drop trying to establish their own righteousness. They love their sin. The Bible talks about how men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. They are coming to the light lest their deeds be reproved. They don't want their sins corrected. They love their sins. And they take it out, well, God doesn't really want to save anybody. Some even come and say, well, God would never send me to hell because he loves everybody, present tense. 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. All should come to repentance. And then this same God that's trying to provide a way, he provided a way for us to go to heaven, and people don't want it. Oh, God wouldn't, do, wouldn't send me to hell. Depart from me, ye accursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. I never knew you. Depart from me, ye who work iniquity. If your name is not in the Lamb's book of life, you're going to hell, and he will send you to hell. Without batting an eyelash, without flinching. Oh, why would a God that's a loving God... God provided a way for us to go to heaven. Why won't you take it? It's not that God doesn't have love. It's you that doesn't have love in the right area. Your love is for yourself. When you have people that have that attitude, their love is for themselves. <coughs> they love the world. <coughs> they love the sins of the flesh. Their love is in the wrong area. If they put their love in the right area, absolute truth, they'd find God would show them how to get saved. Luke, you don't have to turn here, but Luke 13, 3 says, I tell you, nay, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Luke 13, 5 says, I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, <coughs> ye shall all likewise perish. Luke 15, 7 says, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety-nine just persons which need no repentance. And Luke 15, 10 says, Likewise I say over to you, there is joy. There is joy in the presence of angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. Beautiful Savior. Over one sinner that repenteth. Now you say that's Old Testament. The reason I read that from the Old Testament and I read New Testament is because, brother says Christ, repentance has been there in every dispensation of the Bible. Going back to Adam and Eve. Repentance is, oh, as long as sin has been in the world, there's been a chance to repent. God's given you an opportunity to repent. Repentance has always been there in every dispensation. And you've got people saying, oh, repentance isn't here for today. We don't need repentance. We just need belief. Only believe. Only believe. No, we need repentance and then belief. Okay? And that's where we're getting into the second part. So first step to salvation is repentance. Now, brothers and sisters of Christ, you come to somebody who's already broken. They're already in a repentant state. I'm dirty. I'm filthy. I'm no good. Why would God save someone like me? I'm worthless. I'm nothing. Do you tell them, oh, now you need to repent? No, they're already repenting. They're already following step one. You don't have to mention step one. What do you do? You go to step two. What's step two? Belief. Glory, a beautiful Savior. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3. Have you ever noticed, Brother Jesus Christ, how some, and I might do it sometimes too, but how we tend to read the scriptures and sometimes we read over a word and we just, it's like we ignore the word. We act, it's like we pretend the word isn't there. And then later God points it out to us, hey, you, skip, you, you read that, but did you really apply it? I'll give an example of right here. 1 Corinthians 15, 3. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Now when we hear people quote that from memory, a lot of times when people quote that from memory, they'll say how Christ died and was buried and rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. What gets left out? For our sins. 
how Christ died for our sins. For our sins gets left out. And some people will read this and then they'll start preaching and say how Christ died and how he was buried and wrote it. They leave it out in their verbal preaching. But when they read it, they'll read it, but they read right over it like it's nothing. And then they take and cut it out when they go to preach it. I've heard people do this before. It's how Christ died for our sins. How Christ died. Not just that he died. How he died. And that he died for our sins. That's repentance. You can't come to him saying, I love my sin. But I believe in your son. You have to save me, God. No, he does not. No, he does not. You've got to come to God broken. You've got to come to him on his terms. We have. Now, brother says, Christ, repentance, does it stop at, at, at salvation at the cross? No. We, we have to repent through our whole life because we're still in this body of wicked flesh. We still fail the Lord. We still fail each other. We still fail the lost world sometimes by not being a proper light for Jesus Christ. When doors get open, sometimes we cower and we don't pre present the gospel and that door closes. Okay. Sometimes we fail in this life as a Christian, as a Bible-believing, God-fearing man and woman, a Christian according to the Bible, but a Bible-believing, God-fearing man. Okay. Brother and sister Christ is a part of the being in Christ, part of the body of Christ. We fail sometimes. So we continue repenting, clear up until God catches us away and gives us a perfect body. And we have the mind of Christ. Here, we see how he was buried and rose again according to the scriptures. You say, well, what does this have to do? Some people, they get saved, and then they start running 100 miles an hour, and they start forgetting who it is that saved them and what he went through. When you start getting tempted, brothers and sisters in Christ, what do you need to do? You need to go back to the gospel. You need to go back to saying, Lord, I'm being tempted to do something. The old man is dead and buried. I gave my life to you at the cross. Lord, I need to remember what you went through for me at the cross all the time. Okay. Isaiah 53, 5. Isaiah 53, 5. But he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. You go back to what Jesus Christ went through for you, brother says Christ. That's a good motivator to, okay, I'm not going to do that sin. I'm being tempted. I'm being tempted to compromise. I'm being tempted to do this. I'm being tempted. The Bible says there's no temptation taking you as such as common to man, but will with the temptation provide a way for you to escape that you may be able to bear it. God will always provide a way. This is the number one way. Get back into the Word of God. Number two, get back to praying. Right? Number three, I always suggest to brethren is get away from that temptation. If anything's tempting you, get away from it. Take some time. Go for a walk. Jump in the truck and take off. And go, you know, wherever you are. If there's a park, if there's a river, if there's a lake, uh, there's an ocean, go spend some, go somewhere and spend some time. Get out your cue cards. I don't have them here, but I got a booklet here. Get out your cue cards. This has 1 Thessalonians 2.13. Get out your cue cards with uh, Bible verses on it. And walk. Go for a walk. And start reading the verses and talking to God about the verses and how they apply in your heart. And the next thing you realize, that temptation's gone. It's just gone. It just evaporates. When you spend time with God, the person who saved you. Mm -hmm. But we need to remember what he went through. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we were healed. Healed. He was beaten almost beyond recognition. He had his beard ripped out. He was whipped. He was bleeding to death, and he bled to death on the cross. Blood was shed. Hebrews 9.22, you don't have to turn there, it says, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood there is no remission. Jesus went through something that no man has ever gone through. He had his people, everyone that he loved and was there to save, one minute they're yelling, Hosanna in the highest! And the next minute they're spitting in his face, and throwing stuff at him, and spitting at him, and smacking him around. The apostles forsook him. Paul, uh, Peter, who he loved, 
There's Jesus. Uh, there's John, the disciple, whom he loved, but he loved his disciples, but he had Peter denying him three times. Everyone turned on him. The Bible says, and this is in the song, but it's it's not to the second set of stands, but uh, the Bible says he was a man of sorrow, constant sorrow. It's getting quiet in here. Acts 20, 28. Acts 20, 28. This is where we get the verse. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and unto all the flock over which the Holy Ghost had made you overseers to feed the church of God which he had purchased with his own blood. The reason we're supposed to remember the gospel for our entire life and our walk with the Lord down here is because we've got to remember that we are not our own. We were bought with a price, and it was a high price, and God paid it. It was a high, high price, and God paid it. 1 Corinthians 6.19 says, What? Know ye not that your body is a temple for the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. You are bought with a price, and that price was high. It wasn't like I'm giving a dollar to a homeless person, which I do sometimes with the gospel tract. It's not like I'm giving a dollar to a homeless person so they can buy food. That's a meager price. No, this price was high. It was great. And God paid it. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Word and deed need to be glorifying God all the time. It's not easy. I have not, I, I'm going to be honest with you, I'm not trying to put myself on a pedestal. I have not glorified God in my body and in my spirit 24-7 since the day I got saved. I have failed him sometimes. That's where we got to repent and remember what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. And get back to our walk with the Lord. Get back to your walk with the Lord. There it is, Isaiah 17.10. That's what I was looking for, Isaiah 17.10. I did have it in the notes. Because thou hast forgotten the God of thy salvation, and hast not been mindful of the rock of thy strength. You know what sin does, brother says Christ? It pulls you away from this book. It pulls you away from prayer. One sin, oh, just this little one. I'll just, just this little one, I'll let this little one in and it's okay. One sin begets another sin, begets another sin, begets another sin, and the next thing you know, you look back to where you started and it wasn't just an inch, it's like 50 miles. That's why we're not supposed to give an inch. And if you did give an inch, if you did do this and you realize I'm 50 miles away, I'm not trying to make you feel like junk, brother says Christ, but you should have um, your conscience. You should be bummed. It should bug you. And what's the solution? Get back in the Word. Repent, forsake, get back to your walk with the Lord. Get back to your walk with the Lord. Get back to living for Him. Get back to being a light for Him. Jesus died for us. He paid the ultimate price, a price that we couldn't pay. We're bought with a price. So if anybody's here watching that's lost, Jesus died to pay for the sins of the world. If you come to the cross, He, he will receive you. If you come to Him broken, as a re repenting as a sinner, having sorrow for said sin, Believe on Jesus Christ. Believe what He did. Believe He is God manifest in the flesh. It was God's blood that was shed on the cross, and His blood can wash your sins away. Confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. And He will. And He'll give you a new life, and this new life is far better than the life you have now. Guaranteed to any lost person out there. The life that God has given me, no matter what hardships, no matter what hardships in the world, God gives me joy through it all. God gives me peace through it all. God gives me happiness. He gives me blessings. And you know what? When I lose my joy as a, as a saved sinner, and I lose my peace, and I lose the happiness, you know why? Because I lost sight of what Jesus Christ did for me. And I started dabbling back into the flesh. This wicked flesh right here. 
I start dabbling back into the flesh, start compromising and getting into the world, and I start losing that joy. There's things you can lose as a saved sinner. Joy is one of them. But He gives you a new life, and this life is far better than the life I had before. Okay. Remember what it said about repenting. For God saw our work with repentance to God, not to be repented of, not to be repented of. Someone who truly gets saved never, ever regrets getting saved. Never. Not to be repented of, but the sorrows of the world work with death. The next step after belief, brothers is Christ, we need to go back to remembering who it is that died for us and what he went through. We're bought with a price. We belong to God. God, I'm yours. I'm sorry I failed you. I start going this way. I start going that way. Lord, I failed you. Lord, uh, help me get back on the right path. Save me. Not like eternal salvation. I'm talking about in this life, save me and get me back on the life, on the right track. And I don't know, I've said it some more time. Lord, save me again. I'm asking you for your help again. I need saving again because I failed you. I started going down the wrong path. Lord, help get me back on the right path. Save me again. I'm not talking about eternal salvation. I'm talking about in this life, the mistakes that I've made. God has saved me from, from a lot of things that could have happened. Worse things that could have happened. God saved me and protected me. And he does you too, brother, sis, Christ. I know a lot of you have testimonies. The next step is confess. Confess both in prayer. Oh, that's not in the Bible. Turn to Romans chapter 10, verse 8. Oh, no, you're going to the Romans road to hell. How many of you heard that? Romans road to hell. Rome. That's coming from people who love their sin. That's coming from people who love their sin and they're ashamed to come to God on His terms and believe in the real Jesus Christ of the King James Bible. They love their false Jesus that's okay with sin. Hell's not that big of a deal. Sin's not that big of a deal. He came to set you free from God's commandments so you can just live however you want to live. They love that Jesus, but they hate this Jesus. Nope, you're still under God's commands. This Jesus, you get saved, you're still under my command. Here's what I command. It's not the Romans road to hell, it's the Romans road to salvation. Romans 10, 8. But what saith it? The word, the gospel, the true plan of salvation, what Jesus went through, repentance and belief, the word is nigh thee, even thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. That if thou, conf if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Remember what we read over there, how he died for our sins. You confess the Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus is God Almighty, and Jesus' blood that was shed on the cross is God's blood, and it was shed because of my dirty, rotten, filthy, low-down, no-good sins. Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. You confess your repentance. You confess your belief in Jesus Christ, the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And shall believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Shalt be. This comes before salvation. Thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, here, the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Right now, people can lie with their words. But if you keep backing them in the corner with truth, with truth, with truth, their true heart will come out. But some people can put on, can PWC, I always call it PWC, Polly want a cracker, Polly want a cracker. They pair it with, they hear other men in battle buildings, pulpits, men behind the screen. They even pair it what I say sometimes. And is it really coming from down here, or are they just lip, lip syncing? as they say. They're just copying what someone else is saying. They're just repeat, repeating what someone else said. It's not coming from down here. But you back someone in the heart with absolute truth, what happens? But this is Christ. I back people in the corner that um, 
They profess to be saved. I back them in the corner. I treat them as a saved sinner, and I start calling them out on their sins, present tense. The Bible talks about all scriptures given by inspiration is proper for doctrine, for reproving, for proof, for correcting, for correction, and for instruction righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished into all good works. So when you back them in the corner with their sins and say, okay, the Bible says this is wrong, you need to repent and get it out of your life. The Bible says this is wrong, you need to repent and get it out of your life. What is these easy believers, you know what they do? They run back to the cross and say, I don't have to get it out of my life. It's under the blood. Who are you to judge my sin? They try to run back to salvation. Who are you to judge me? I'm saved. I'm a Christian. I wasn't judging your salvation. I was judging your sins, present tense. See, when you back them in the corner, their true self comes out. They love their sin. They're going to hold on to their sin. They never repented. And their belief, they call it, the Bible says it's vain. We, some people have said head belief. But the Bible says you can have belief, but it's vain. Why? Because you reject the new creature in Christ Jesus. You reject being in Christ Jesus. You reject the resurrection of Jesus Christ by not being a new creature in Christ Jesus. Go ahead. So remember, someone can lie with the mouth, but eventually the truth will come out. But the Bible says the reason the truth comes out eventually every time is because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. They can't hide it forever. The truth will come out. But that belief, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, the repentance, the belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ, it happens here. And then it comes out here in a confession. Thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. And with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. The confession comes before salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Shall not be ashamed, brother, says Christ. It comes before salvation. Be careful of those wicked devils out there that will say it's the Romans road to hell. They're on their way to hell and they're trying to drag as many people with them. Don't fall for it. Don't fall for it. Okay. Romans 1.16 says, Romans 1.16, turn there. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. They are. But this is Christ, we're not. We are not ashamed. I'm not ashamed to confess that before I got saved, I was a dirty, rotten, low-down, no-good sinner on my way to hell, and I deserved to go to hell for sinning against God. I was worthless as can be, and I came broken, and I was sorry for that state that I was in on my way to hell. I was on my way to hell, and I deserve it. No excuse, Lord. I have no excuse. You notice how some people like to give excuses left and right? Yeah, that's wrong. However... Yeah, I shouldn't have done that, but they always have some kind of excuse. It wasn't as bad as that person over there. Or, I, I, I did it because of such and such. And, uh, 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 excuse, 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 pointing the finger at someone else, trying to compare yourself to someone else. You know, that's, like I said before, they come and say, I'm a sinner, but you're a sinner, I'm a sinner, we're all sinners. What is that? You're comparing your sins to the world's. You're supposed to come to God personally. And it has nothing to do with the world's sins. It has to do with your sins. And they can't handle that. They always have some kind of excuse. Some kind of excuse. And they, now, like I said, one of the big teachings is the Romans road to hell. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. What's the power? The changed life. You can have men that are most evil, wicked, vile men that you've ever seen. And when God saves them, they come to God on His terms, and God saves them. You see a new man, new creature in Christ Jesus. And you look at him, and you're like, how did that even happen? That's not the same man. That's, there's no, how, that's, not, that's impossible. That's, no, nothing was impossible with God. It's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. 
For there is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as is written, the just shall live by faith. Is your faith wavering, brother and sister Christ, in these last days? Are you being distracted? Are you being tempted by the flesh? Being distracted by the world? Being pressured by the world? Family members, friends, co-workers? Oh, it's not that big a deal. A little bit doesn't hurt. A little bit don't hurt. They try to get you to that first sin that leads to a, a lot more, and they're just trying to pull you away from the Lord. And next thing you know, you're not taking this book as serious as you used to when you first got saved. Your faith isn't as strong as it once was when you first got saved. You need to get back to your first love, brother says Christ. This book, the Word of God. Salvation. The changed life. God command, I obey. The doctrines. The instruction in righteousness. Your first love. When I got saved, I couldn't put this book down. I was watching study after study after study, learning as much as I could about this book. I still am today. But there's sometimes I catch myself where it slows down and I need to, I need to pick it back up. I need to get back to my first love. Have I gone days without reading the Bible? I'm not supposed to go one day without reading the Bible. Have I gone days, plural, without reading the Bible? That's serious. Mm -hmm. I'm not ashamed. And the last step, when you've come to God broken as a repentant sinner and believing in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, how he died for our sins, was buried and rose again the third day, and the blood that was shed is God's blood. Jesus said it is finished because it's God's blood can wash any sins away, any and all sins. You confess both in prayer, and the last step is you ask God to save you. Romans 10, 13, I know, I know, they try to push the Romans road to hell. Why? Because they don't want to go to heaven. They want to go to hell, and they want to drag as many people with them. Don't fall for that, brothers and sisters in Christ. Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men in every dispensation, since sin entered the world, in every dispensation, God has been saving mankind. And when you get into the second dispensation, which we haven't talked about yet, uh, the, uh, the, uh, of conscience, the age of conscience, the laws of God are written on every man's heart. When you get into that age, you get to, you don't have to turn here, but uh, Genesis 4, chapter 4, we read, and Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son, and called his name Seth. For God said, She hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. And Seth, and to Seth, to him were also born sons, and he called his name Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. Lord, save me. Lord, forgive me of my sins. They started doing offerings. Lord, forgive me. Lord, save me. It's always been there, but now all of a sudden, today, there's this big movement pushing. They're taking prayer out of getting saved. You don't have to ask God to save you. You always had to in the past. There's people in the future that have to, but present tense, you don't have to. What changed? This didn't change. This says you have to. But here comes man in with their own wisdom. Haven't God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Oh, yeah. Romans 10, 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And we're going to, I'm going to get into a whole other story. They say the whosoever clause. Be careful of that, brothers and Christ. Be careful not to fall for that either. If you read the whole chapter of Romans 10, it tells you they come in a repentant state, believing in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, confessing both in prayer. And then when you get to that point, that's the whosoever. The whosoever isn't just anybody. You can't have someone who re refuses to repent, who doesn't believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, but they'll sit there and say, Lord, save me. Well, the whosoever clause, God just has to save them. No, he does not. God doesn't have to save anybody. The Bible says God will have mercy on whom he will have mercy. And I can't remember if it was venge uh, vengeance, wrath, or judgment on whom he will have vengeance, wrath, or judgment. But God will have mercy on whom he will have mercy. God's not forced to save anybody. I did not earn salvation. You know how it goes back to earning salvation? If God is forced to save you, then you earned it. I didn't earn it. It was a gift. 
Right. It was a gift. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I like reading verse 10. For ye are created in Christ Jesus unto good works, that have before been ordained that ye should walk in them. It's before ordained that when you truly get saved, there's going to be a changed life. You're going to live for Jesus Christ. There's going to be a difference in you. There's going to be a change in you. But it's not of works. But what do they do? They try to turn belief into works. Only believe, only believe. It's faith alone. I earned. I got saved by my faith. Not God's grace. God didn't do the saving. I saved myself through faith. I saved myself through works. You have some false religions out there that push good works to be saved. And you don't know if you're going to heaven if you die or not. Uh, they try to turn prayer into a work. Some people turn prayer into like a work. and the, They turn it into a work saying don't pray at all. And then some people say you should pray, but they turn it to the work when they try to screw this up, when they say the whosoever clause. They make it a work, and you've earned it. God has to save you. No, he does not. God will have mercy on whom he will have mercy. He chooses who he wants to save. You come to him broken. He says this. If you come to him broken in a repentant state, believing in the finished work of Jesus Christ, confessing both in prayer, when you come to him on his terms... His state, He wants to save you. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He wants to save you. Amen. Isaiah 55, 6 we read. If you want to turn there, Isaiah 55, 6. Seek ye the Lord while ye may be found. Call ye upon Him while He is near. I know this is Old Testament, but seek ye the Lord while ye may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way. For today, you've got to throw your iniquities on the foot of the cross. Ooh, power fickler. You've got to throw your iniquities at the foot of the cross. You've got to come to God broken and say, These are the sins of my life. I don't want them anymore. I cannot overcome sin in my life. I don't have that strength. You throw your iniquities at the foot of the cross. Lord, I'm a dirty, rotten, filthy, low. This is the man that I am, the old man, the dirty, rotten, filthy man. You throw him at the foot of the cross, and he gets crucified with Christ. Okay. Back here, he was telling him, yeah, you need to repent. We're going to be doing another study on this, too, about what repentance is in the Bible. But it says, repent and turn. People always try to say, repentance is a work. It's you cleaning up your life and then getting saved. It's two separate things in the Bible. It says, repent and turn from your wickedness. Repent happens in the heart. It's how you view sin, how you view yourself in that sin, and the consequences of that sin when it comes to God Almighty. It happens here. And then you turn from the wickedness after you repent. The Bible says for today, when you get truly saved, if you truly repented after salvation, you're going to have fruits, meat for repentance. That's the changed life. You're going to say, God, clean up my life. Lord, God, command me. You're in charge now, God. I'm bought with the price. I belong to you. I'm a bondservant to Jesus Christ. Command. Let the wicked forsake his ways, way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon you say, why did you read that to us? We're saved. We're saved. Why would you? Because, Brother Jesus Christ, that's a good verse for the life of a Christian. Your whole life you're supposed to be seeking the Lord. Taking God's word, hiding it in your heart, and living it. You found Jesus Christ. You found true plan of salvation. Hold on to it here and never let it go. You know there's brethren out there that they got saved through the true plan of salvation, but through the pressures of the Babel buildings that they go to and lost family members, they'll go and turn and say, well, I got saved off repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confess my brother. But really it was just belief. All you need is belief, only belief. They're forgetting the God of their salvation. They're compromising. They're giving in to the pressures of this world. I've come across some of those. I believe they truly got saved. But what happened? They become part of the falling away. They're starting to become, remember, God's house is made up of gold and silver, wood and earth. Some to honor the gold and silver, some to dishonor wood and earth. You have some people that start over on the, the gold and silver, but at the end, they become wood and earth. 
may become to dishonor. It can happen. The falling away. Call upon him while ye are near. Where, brothers says Christ, if you're hurting and you're failing the Lord, call upon him. Say, Lord, help me. Save me from my mistakes. Save me from this mess that I've made. And the Lord will point you to this right here and open this book to you and get you back on the right path. Oh, yeah. Okay. The world's way, I want to say this, the world's way leads to hell. God's way leads to everlasting life. Don't forget that. Some brethren have forgotten that and they start going back to doing things the world's way. The world's way always leads to hell. And as a, if you're truly saved, you're not going to go to hell if you go back to doing things the world way, but you're going to be that wooden earth. You're going to be that Christian that's dis, to, to dishonor. You're going to be worthless as a Christian. And there will be chastisement to get you back on the right path. But when you're lost and you're trying to seek truth, the world's way leads to hell. We have that testimony. Don't forget it. God's way leads to everlasting life. 1 John 5, 11, we read, And this is the record, that God hath given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God, not God the Son, the pagan trinity, not God the Son, it's the capitalist Son of God, hath not life. But this is Christ. Why do we go back through salvation? Uh, to say, why do I preach salvation to saved and lost? To remind us, brother, says Christ, who it is that saved us. Why we needed to get saved. First, the, why we needed to get saved. Sin. Hell. We're heading for destruction. Who it is that saved us? God the Father through His Son, Jesus Christ. And His sacrifice on the cross. He bled out, and it was God's blood that was shed, He bled out, to pay for the sins of the world as a whole. To pay for your sins and my sins, brothers and sisters of Christ. To remind us. Stay on that path. That narrow, narrow path. And then comes in the new life. After salvation, there's a new life. Romans 6, 4. Therefore we are buried with him in baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. The old man is dead and buried. We threw the old man at the foot of the cross. We didn't want the old man anymore. The old man was on his way to hell. The new man's on his way to heaven. Do you get that? Some, brother, some people out there for, are trying to pervert the scriptures. Oh, that, that conversion, that's not there. You just believe, only believe, only believe. You don't have to actually... Uh, be buried with him in baptism. You don't have to give up the old man. And then what does Paul do? He warns us a lot about not resurrecting the old man. The old man was on his way to hell. Why would you want to resurrect the old man? This flesh deceives you, gets, uh, tempts you, and you start giving into the flesh because the flesh wants to resurrect the old man. Satan wants you to resurrect the old man. The world loves the old man. They say the old man's the way to go. But are we supposed to be listening to the world? No. We're supposed to be seeking the Lord while he may be found. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Romans 10.15, you have to turn there, but remember what it said, and how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. I'm sorry this took a little bit, but beautiful Savior. You don't have to take this long on the gospel every time you're doing a study, but beautiful Savior. How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel. That live a life of Christ. And they're a living testimony. Not just a verbal, but a living testimony. How beautiful. Beautiful Savior. Is your beautiful Savior shining through you, brother, sister Christ? Or is that light candle, like a candle that's gone down all the way and it's about to go out? Right. Beautiful Savior, brother, sister Christ. Beautiful Savior. The next one on here is, and like I said, take time out to read the gospel. Take time out to read the gospel. It's important. 
take time out to preach the gospel. If you're a man in ministry, if you come across it, it doesn't have to be 30 minutes long. You can just say, hey, repent. The Bible says, for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrows of the world worketh death, and believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. How that Jesus died for our sins, according to the scriptures, was buried and rose again the third days, according to the scriptures. It's God's blood that was shed. Confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How long did that take? Does it take that long? But there's some men that they get away from preaching the gospel and won't even take time to preach the gospel in the middle of a message when the gospel comes up. Take some time, brother, sister Christ. In this study, it came up. Glorious Savior. What is God saving us from? Ourselves, our sin, our wicked, sinful state, hell. He's a beautiful Savior. The next one is Glorious Lord. Glorious Lord. You know, turn to Exodus 15, 6. Exodus 15, 6. Thy right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemy. It, Exodus 15, 11. Jump down a couple few verses. It says, Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the lowercase g, gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praise, doing wonders? Glorious oftentimes is a synonymous with victorious, being victorious. God is holy. Now this is Old Testament, but think about what Jesus Christ, how he overcame the sin and death. He was perfect. He was glorious. He's holy. The Bible says, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Victory. When we have a glorious Lord, it's because we have a Lord that's victorious. He's not. He, remember what it says, I'm not a man that I should repent? There's two types of repentance in the Bible change of mind, change of heart. Mankind has a change of heart because we're sinful and wicked and we're wrong. God has a change of mind because we repent. God repents. He repents of the evil he planned to do to people. Okay? But he's not a sinner. God is not, the capital G God, does not sin, does not make mistakes. He is perfect. He is glorious. He's victorious. And the other lowercase g gods, they're just as wicked as they come. Just wicked, wicked as can be. The lowercase g God of all these false religions, even trying to come into the fake Christianity that's out there, the fake religions that try to claim this, the Word of God, they, they use, most of them use a lot of the Bible versions, but claim the term Christianity, uh, they're following lowercase g gods. They're just wick, wicked and sinful. And the people that follow them oftentimes are just so worldly and wicked as can be. But thy right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. God is victorious in his power. What did we just talk about? For the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. What's that power? God can clean up your life. God can set you back on the path. He can save you from your sins. He can save you from hell. He's glorious. Romans chapter 8 verse 1. There is, therefore, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Remember, there's two laws there. The law of the Spirit of life, which is in Christ Jesus, hath made me free from the law of sin and death. This is one of the verses I was using in that study, Brother Says Christ, that they got really upset, the easy believism. I'm not under the laws. I'm not under the laws. I'm not under any law. I'm my own master. I'm my own boss. I decide what I'm going to do. And I decide what's right and wrong. Yea, hath God said, Ye can be as God's knowing good and evil. Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods, lowercase g gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, feel for and praise, doing wonders? You turn yourself in your own God. I'm my own God. I'll decide what's right and wrong. You're still under a law, but you're under the law of the Spirit of life, which is in Christ Jesus. 
hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, there we see it, the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law may be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the capital S spirit. Glorious Lord, victorious, he overcame the law of sin and death. Um, why the Bible says that we're supposed to give God glory in all things? Why? Because He's glory. He, he's glorious. He's the glorious Lord. He's victorious in all things. He's very victorious. In the Old Testament, He overcame the enemy. King David always gave God the glory. You are victorious today, Lord. You were glorious today, O oh Lord. You overcame our enemies. When it comes to salvation, we have a glorious Lord. He overcame the law of sin and death. He was victorious. That's the whole point of believing in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus was victorious. He is God fully and completely. God the Father manifest in the flesh. He overcame the law of sin and death. The Bible talks about how he went down to hell to get the keys of, 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 of hell and death. He went over to Abraham's bosom, led captive, captivity captive, led them out. He was victorious. Amen. And I put this in my notes. God, through Jesus Christ, overcame the law of sin and death, which I said, but we are two-thirds redeemed. That's where we get two-thirds redeemed. This body of flesh isn't redeemed. He, he redeemed our soul and our spirit. And when he calls us home at the, at the catching away of the body of Christ, it says the dead in Christ shall rise first. They'll get their incorruptible bodies. Then we which remain and alive shall be changed. Then we get our incorruptible bodies. Then we're fully and completely redeemed. That's why we say that's going to be a glorious day when God has full victory and gives us the victory over this body of wicked flesh. Completely. How many of us are tired of this body of flesh? I am. 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. That's the 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality. So, so, so when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is thy sting? Glorious Lord, victorious, swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast. Our Lord, God is a great God. He's a victorious God. He's a glorious God. Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. We're to continue living for the Lord and doing the work of the Lord no matter what. No matter how bad this world gets. The world doesn't dictate what we do. Some brethren are getting, in, getting distracted by it, and it is dictating what they're doing. Our mission doesn't change, brothers and Christ, because how bad the world gets out there. Our mission remains the same. We're to live for the Lord Every day with the life that we're living. We're supposed to be looking for that blessed hope. Every day with the life that we're living. Living for the Lord. Being a light to this dark world. And preaching the gospel. Living for Jesus Christ. And I keep putting this out there. How many of you love the appearing of Jesus Christ? How many of you put him off? Are being deceived into putting it off? If you put off the, the, the catching away of the body of Christ. Oh, it's not going to happen today. It's not going to happen for at least a few more years. Then you don't love the appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Have you been deceived into not looking, present tense, with the life that you're living for that blessed hope? Brothers and sisters, things to think about. Okay? Glorious Lord, He overcame sin and death, the law of sin and death. 
And someday he's going to overcome this right here by giving us a new body. All right, now we have to live in this. That's why we have to keep repenting. Repentance stays in our life, clear up to the catching away of the body of Christ. That's why that belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ is so important. We need to stay holding to it, clear up to the catching away of the body of Christ. And remembering what Jesus did for us. When we start forgetting the God of thy salvation, what happens? You start going into the world and the way of the world. You take your eyes off Jesus Christ, that glorious Savior, the glorious Lord. Acts 17, 27, we read. Acts 17, 27. That they should seek the Lord. There it is again. That they should seek the Lord. That seems to be in every dispensation, isn't it? That they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after Him and find Him, that though He be not far from every one of us. For in Him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Now the Bible says, now we are the sons of God. When you get saved and born again, you now are you the son of, sons of God. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that God is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's devices. They try to tear God's gloriness down and make it like a wooden statue. Gold statue, silver statue, stone statue, wood statue. 30. And at this time, so this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. Jesus Christ, who is a glorious Lord. Remember, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess. He is glorious Lord. He's victorious. He's on top. Is he being treated that way, brother, says Christ, by the world? No, but by you and me, he's supposed to be treated that way. His word is on top. He's on top. His word's on top. That's why he's capital W word, and we have a lowercase w word in the Bible. You have the manifest word, the phys God's word being spoken physically through his body, his son, Jesus Christ. And then you have the lowercase w word that's given to us by the Holy Spirit. Man spake, uh, God's word was spoken by men as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And we're not to accept it as the words of men, we're supposed to accept it as the words of God. As is in truth the word of God. But he's going to ordain, he's going to judge the world. Jesus is going to judge the world. Who he hath ordained. Whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. Brothers, says Christ, that the, the verse that says, At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus is the Lord. Therefore, it says, Therefore, every one of us shall give an account of himself before God. And one of the things they don't like is that mankind is going to be given, uh, save sinners, is going to have to give an account to God. Mankind doesn't want to give an account to God. But you've got this movement say, that you're being taught coping and sharing and love and, the, and that you're not going to have to give an account for yourself as a safe sinner. Oh, yes, you will at the judgment seat of Christ, the Bible talks about. We're going to have to give an account of our life as a Christian. We're still going to have to answer to Jesus Christ. Why? Because he's glorious Lord. Romans 14, 11, we read, for it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God, so that every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. 1 Timothy 6.15 says, Which in these his time he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Revelation 17.14 says, These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is the Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. What does God do with his enemies? Revelation 20, 14. And death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whoso was not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. We have a glorious Lord, a victorious Lord. He's glorious in every way. He's glorious in power. He's glorious in honor. He's glorious in purity. He's victorious. Brother says, Christ, have you forgotten that? Or are you holding true to that?
The next part in the stanza, it says, Emmanuel, God is with us. Now, a lot of us know, remember from the scriptures, that, yeah, this is truth. But you always still verify with the scriptures because you can learn things. Okay? Matthew 123. Turn to Matthew 123. Now, we've already debunked this, that uh, Mary and Joseph were not in sin for naming the child Eman uh, uh, Jesus over Emmanuel. Okay? That's just a bad teaching by someone who's lost sight of what truth is. Okay? Matthew one twenty three says, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is being interpreted is God with us. So what they're going to be saying is, is God is with us. Okay? They say, well, they'll call it, that's one of his names. Yes, but that's not the name that's above all names. And we've already proven that. Okay? But Emmanuel, God is with us. Is that what Emmanuel means? Yes, Emmanuel means God is with us. God the Father manifests in the flesh through his Son, Jesus Christ. When you see Jesus Christ, you see God the Father. He that has seen me has seen the Father, what Jesus says in the, in the Gospels. I and my Father are one. But more importantly, he that seeth me, he that hath seen me has seen the Father. God with us. Hebrews 13, 5 we read, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such thing as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. You say, well, is Jesus Christ... God, the Father, is He with us today? Yes, He is. But how? Turn to John 14, 16. John 14, 16. And I will pray the Father, and He shall give you another Comforter, that He may be abide with you forever, even the Spirit of Truth, talking about the Holy Spirit, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth Him not, neither knoweth Him. But ye know Him, for He dwelleth in you and shall be in you. Now this is Jesus Christ. We just read, okay, that God is, is going to be with us, that Jesus is God with us. Jesus, that's the name that's above all names, is also called Emmanuel. God with us. Here he's talking about, Jesus talking about the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. Okay. Verse 18, I will not leave you comfortless. This is Jesus Christ speaking. I will come to you. Wait, 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 wait. He's sending the Holy Spirit, but then he says, I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. And that day ye shall know that I am in the Father, and ye in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments, and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. The Lord gives us the Holy Spirit. God the Father, through Jesus Christ and by his Holy Spirit, he's with us. Now understand, Emmanuel is talking about when Jesus was physically on the earth. It's God manifest in the flesh, and the likeness of sinful flesh. But is God with us today? Yes. Okay. Some brethren, uh, like I said, I got some thumbs down, but some brethren didn't like that. When I was told, I said, you got to be careful what you're singing. you got to compare it to the scriptures. More of you in my life. If you have the Holy Spirit in you, you can't get more of God in you than that. You can't. The Holy Spirit of God dwelleth in you and is with you. The hidden man of the heart, the Bible's talking about for a... Uh, uh, a brother, I mean, sorry, sister in Christ. All right. The hidden man of the heart. You're supposed to have Jesus in you. You're supposed to have God in you. That goes back to the Godhead. It's a whole other study. But God is with you 24-7. That's why it's very important. Another way to try to motivate you not to sin is when you go to sin that sin, do you ever stop to think that Jesus Christ, imagine Jesus Christ standing right next to you as you're trying to, as you're about to do it. You say, but he isn't physically next to me. He's here. The Holy Spirit is in you. He's watching. He's there. 
Okay, he'll never leave us nor forsake us. He's given us the Holy Spirit. His Holy Spirit. John 14, 19 says, Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in the Father, and ye in me, and I in you. I want to re-emphasize that. I in you. Okay. But Emmanuel, God is with us. Is that biblical? Yes, it is. It's in the Bible. Okay, God with us. Brother says Christ, don't forget that. That's one of the biggest things. You think that you can hide. If you think you're by yourself and you think you can hide, I'm pointing her over the computer, uh, get drunk privately, get doing drugs privately, whatever. You think that it's just you privately and you can hide it. You can't hide anything from him. Remember Paul. When Paul said that it seemed like everybody had forsaken him, there were some times in his ministry where he was in prison, and it seemed like he was he, that everyone had forsaken him. But you know what he said? He said, "But I'm not alone. Jesus is with me. He had the Holy Spirit in him. God was with him. He wasn't alone. Brothers, is Christ? We we love that as a comfort." We're never alone, especially when, it go, when we're going through hard times. But how often do you stop and think about it when you start getting tempted to do things the world's way and stray from this right here? When you start get tempted for to start falling back, not fall, tempted back into sin. Where is that God is with me always? Where is that attitude then? It seems to kind of vanish and, like vapors and just disappear. Uh, no, if you're truly saved and born again, God is with you 24-7. He's always with you. He'll never leave you and he'll never forsake you. God with us, Emmanuel. The next one talks about Blessed Redeemer. Blessed Redeemer. This goes back to where we are talking about the flesh, where the body's not redeemed, but the soul's redeemed and the spirit's redeemed. But we're still waiting on on being redeemed for this body of flesh. He's a blessed redeemer. Remember that blessed hope. Psalms 145.2 says, Every day will I bless thee, and I will praise thy name forever and ever. Every day. Okay. The Bible says we're supposed to be looking, present tense, for that blessed hope. What's the hope? The redemption of the purchased possession. We are sealed unto the day of redemption. Getting ahead of myself a little bit. Revelation 5.13 we read, And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and such are in the sea, and all that are in them, hear I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Blessing. Blessing is one of them. He's a blessed Redeemer. Isaiah 47, 4 we read, As for our Redeemer, the Lord of hosts is His name, the Holy One of Israel. Now that's for Old Testament, but who's our Redeemer? The Lord. 1 Corinthians 8, 6 says there's one capital G God, the Father, and there's one capital L Lord, Jesus Christ. Who's our Redeemer today? Jesus Christ. Who are we looking for, brother, sister, Christ? We've already mentioned some of these verses. Who are we, who are we looking for? We're looking for the great, our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, to call us home, to our real home. To redeem us fully and completely. So we can get rid of this wicked body of flesh. Some of us are getting weary with, the, with the, the fight, that we're supposed to be fighting the good fight. Some of us are getting weary with this world, this wicked world. Some of us are definitely getting weary with this flesh, fighting this flesh all the time. We're looking forward to that blessed Redeemer, the redemption of the purchased possession. Isaiah 48, 17 we read, Thus saith the Lord, Thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. I am the Lord thy God, who teacheth thee to profit, which leadeth thee by the way that thou shouldest go. 
you get saved, God comes into your life, takes over, he's, he's the commander, he's the chief. Onward, that narrow path right there. Oh, but Lord, this path seems easier. Oh, that path over there seems a lot more fun. Flesh is fun. And the Lord's like, I'm the commander in chief, the narrow road. Keep on the narrow road. Keep us going. Why? Because we're looking for that blessed hope. The day that we get redeemed fully and completely. He's called a redeemer. Jeremiah 50, verse 34. We read it again. Their redeemer is strong. Kind of like a glorious Lord. The redeemer is strong. The Lord of hosts is his name. He shall thoroughly plead their cause, and that he may give rest to the land and disquiet the inhabitants of Babylon. He shall, he shall thoroughly plead their cause. Would we read before? There is one meter between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. He's up there pleading our cause. Blessed Redeemer. Yeah. Colossians 1.14. Colossians 1.14. Here we get into the New Testament. Colossians 1.14. And whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Redemption. What's that talking about? Our soul and our spirit are redeemed. Remember that spiritual circumcision. I'm just doing the scissors with my fingers if you can't see. A spiritual circumcision made without hands. Our soul was once connected to this wicked body. And the sins that this body would do would taint our soul. But we have that spiritual circumcision that our soul is now connected to Jesus Christ. Our soul has to have a body. Even if, right, we're connected to Jesus Christ. His body. That's why we're called the body of Christ. That's how you're in Christ Jesus our Lord. And this body, of, we're still having to deal with this body of flesh, but our soul has been redeemed and our spirit's been, re been redeemed. The Bible says that our souls are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus right now because our soul is connected to Jesus Christ. Where is Jesus Christ right now? I go to prepare a place for you. In my Father's house there are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. He's in heaven right now. He's seated at the right hand of God. That's how we're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Okay? But we're waiting for one redemption, this right here. He's been a blessed redeemer. He's redeemed our soul. He's redeemed our spirit. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Now we're waiting on our, our body to be redeemed. Ephesians 1.14 Which is the earnest of our inheritance until... The redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Unto the purchased, redemption of the purchased possession. Remember what I said in Ephesians 4.30? It says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. See, it's not contradictions if you rightly divide. 2 Timothy 2.15 Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. There's three parts of us that need to be redeemed. So when you talk, when you listen to Colossians 1.14, in whom we have, present tense, redemption through his blood, that's redemption for what? The soul and the spirit. Then you get to Ephesians, where it says, until, Ephesians 1.14, until the redemption of the purchased possession, until, it's talking about the body. We know the soul has been redeemed. We know the spirit's been redeemed. We've been made spiritually alive. Our soul is connected to Jesus Christ. When God the Father looks at us, when it comes to righteousness, He sees the body, Jesus Christ, and His righteousness is imputed to our soul. He sees Jesus Christ. Because we are in Him. Okay. Blessed Redeemer. Ephesians 2.1 says, And you hath He quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. Talking about your soul and your spirit. But this body of flesh, it's still decaying. I'm getting old. I'm falling apart. And if I, if God catches me up in death, in other words, I die before the catching away of the body of Christ, this body is going to go into the ground and worms are going to eat it. 
I'm just going to decay and go back to dust. From dust thou were created, from dust thou art. The dirt of the ground, or the dust of the ground. It's all about Adam was created, and that's all mankind since the fall of, of Adam and Eve. Uh, this wicked body goes back to the ground. So, like I said, you have to rightly divide the word of truth. Colossians 2.13 and you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Luke 20, 38 says, For he is not a God of the dead, but of the living. For all live unto him. You don't live for your flesh. You don't live for the world. You live unto him. We're living Looking our lives when you're looking for that blessed hope in the studies we've been doing lately. Are you looking for that blessed hope? Are you present tense looking for the catching away of the body of Christ with the life that you're living? You're living unto him until he calls us home. He's going to redeem us one day, brothers and Christ, as far as the, the, this body of flesh. He's already redeemed our soul and our spirit. He's given us a new life. He's made us spiritually alive. You were being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh. Hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven all you all of your trespasses? This body of flesh can no longer taint my soul. This body of flesh can cost me rewards in heaven. It can cost me joy. You can lose your joy. It can cost me peace. You can lose your peace. It can cost me blessings. You can miss out on a blessing. Well, you can miss out on a blessing. It can cost you things, but the one thing it's never going to be able to do again when you get saved is it's never going to be able to scar your soul with sin. Your soul is now connected to Jesus Christ. He is our blessed Redeemer. Blessed Christ. Blessed Redeemer. That is true. Are you keeping your eyes on that blessed hope? Are you looking forward to when this body, this wicked body of flesh gets redeemed? Are you praising God and living a life as you're as living a life of a soul and spirit being redeemed? Are you living a life of Christ until we get this body of flesh redeemed? Blessed Redeemer. Next part of the stanza said, Living Word, capital W Word, Living Word, John 1.1. 1, 1. How many of you knew I was going to go here? John 1.1. 1, 1. It's the easiest one. A lot of people still deny this. I, I just... You, you, I don't want to say that you, you, you have to be lost 100%, but you have to be either lost 100% lost. There's no other way to be lost as 100%. Or someone who's really strayed from this book. Their heart is far from this book. They've forgotten the God of their salvation. But they attack this when it said, talks about Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. This is a great verse proving that God the Father had a body in the Old Testament, and it's Jesus Christ. Right? An incorruptible body. John 1.1 1, 1. In the beginning was the capital W Word. It's taught about before creation began. And then we learn that Jesus is the one who created everything. And for thy pleasure they are and were created. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Talk about Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the Word, capital W, Word. And the Word was with God, the Father, the soul. So you have a body, and you have a soul. He's with God, the Father. And the Word was God. The soul and the body are one. They're connected. They're one. Just as we are connected to this body when we're lost, and then when we get saved, this soul is connected to Jesus Christ. He's our body. His righteousness is imputed to us. God the Father is connected to Jesus Christ. Soul is connected to the body. They are one. The capital W word was God. Oh, but Jesus is not the Father and the Father is not Jesus. Then you don't worship the God of this book right here, the King James Bible. You don't worship the God that created everything. Be careful not uh, what the Bible says about cast not, cast not that which is holy among the dogs, neither cast ye pearls before swine. Something I had to learn, it was hard to learn, 
was that you try to preach truth to someone at, at the start, but when you realize that this isn't their final authority and they're not a Bible believer, they can profess to be a Bible believer all they want. When you find that they're not a Bible believer because they keep questioning this book, trying to change this book, ignore this book, all you can do is preach the gospel to them and move on. Preach the gospel to them and move on. Don't cast that which is holy among the dogs, neither cast ye pearls before swine. Why? Because they'll turn around and rend you. They'll wait for you to make a mistake and rend you. Oh yeah. They'll take that which is holy and the pearls that you're given to them and they cast it by the wayside. They don't care about this. When you come across those people, be careful. Okay? Try to preach truth to people, absolutely. But when you find out they don't want the truth, move on. Brush the dirt off your feet and move on. Okay? Let the blind lead the blind. If the blind lead the blind, they both shall fall into a ditch. Let them alone. Let them alone. The same was in the beginning with God. So we have capital W word is another is is talking about God's body. Talking about God manifest in the flesh. And it's oftentimes referred to as Jesus Christ because his name is revealed in the Gospels that the body of God is his name that's above all names is Jesus. Jesus Christ. Turn to Romans chapter 5, verse 6. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commended his love towards us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified his, by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Living Word, capital W Word, we're going to be saved from God the Father's wrath through His Son, Jesus Christ. Remember, it says Living Word. It says how the two-time Christ died for the ungodly. He's dead, right? But He rose again. We talked about this in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. How that Jesus, how that Jesus died for our sins was buried, and rose again the third day. Revelation chapter 1, verse 18. Revelation 1, 18. I am he that liveth. Talk about God the Father. I am he that liveth, and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen, and have the keys of hell and death. I serve a risen Savior. We serve a living God. Okay, He's not a God of the dead, but of the living, the Bible says. I'm alive forevermore. Living Word. Acts 5.30. Turn to Acts 5.30. The God of our Father raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Again, in Acts 10.40 we read, Him God raised up the third day and showed Him openly. Now, I'm not trying to get into the Godhead too much, but the Godhead, you see, God raised Him from the dead. Then it talks about how being put to death in the flesh, they put Him to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. This book claims the Holy Spirit can lay claim to raising Jesus from the dead, the body of God from the dead. Here we see God the Father taking credit for raising the body, His body, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, from the dead. And then you read about Jesus when He talks to the people, uh, and they think He's talking about the physical temple, but He says, destroy this temple, He's talking about His own body, in three days, and I will raise it up. The body claims He raised up. You say, how does that work? All it takes is one part of the Godhead, God the Father, the Son of God, or the Holy Spirit raising from the dead, and all three can claim credit for it. Why? Because these three are one. They can each claim credit for it. That's the Godhead of the King James Bible. Okay. But we serve a risen Savior, a living, a living Savior, okay. the living Word. Colossians 2.12, we read, Buried with Him in baptism, 
when in all, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of, of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. Raised him from the dead. We serve a risen Savior. I did a, God blessed me with doing a Bible study about um, the no change life gospel and what it really means to believe in vain. What it's talking about in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, how you can believe in vain. And you keep reading that whole chapter, it's talking about the resurrection. And then you compare scripture with scripture, we're supposed to have a new life. We're supposed to have a resurrection. How can your belief be in vain? Worthless. You're not a new creature in Christ Jesus. You're not in Christ Jesus. You don't have the new man. And if you don't have the new man, you're a false convert. And people will mock this. You didn't earn salvation with new man. The new man is evidence of salvation. If I sit here and say, I'm wearing a hat. Let's say I turn the camera off, you can't see anything. And I just tell you, I'm wearing a hat. You say, what's the proof? You turn on the camera. Am I wearing a hat? No, I lied to you. Let's say you turn, on, turn off the camera and I say, I'm wearing a hat. And you turn on the camera, here's the evidence that I'm wearing a hat. You see how that works? Same thing with, being, uh, with people professing to be saved. I'm saved, okay. P Paul says, prove your own selves. Okay. Prove your own selves. Check whether you be in the faith. Why? Where's the new creature in Christ Jesus? Where's the evidence of salvation? Okay. That's what it means to believe in vain. When you don't live a life of a new creature in Christ Jesus, you're not living as a man that's in Christ Jesus. The old man is still alive, thriving and kicking. You didn't come to him broken. You tried to slip up some other way and... Paul, Jesus talks about this, being a thief and a robber. When someone tries to sneak up any other way, that, that person is a thief and a robber. There's one way to get to heaven today. One way. God's way. You have to come to Him on His terms. There's one door. I am the door, Jesus said. Any man that cometh to me, you have to go through that door. And what a thief does is they try to come up a back way. They try to find some other way to heaven other than coming through the door, coming to God on His terms. I don't like those terms. I'm going to try to come up with my own terms. The old man is dead and buried with Jesus Christ. The new man is raised. You can't get around that. You come across somebody that's just the old man. His attitude towards this book, oh, there is no perfect written word of God. I'm getting that attack a lot lately. There is no perfect written word of God. I can live however I want, do what I want. They look like the world, act like the world, laugh at the world's jokes. They mock this book. They mock the Lord, our Lord and Savior of this book. They mock the God of this book, and yet they want to claim that they're Christians. But it's the old man that's thriving. They're led by the flesh. Carnally minded, walking after the flesh. Traditions of men run them. Wisdom of this world runs them. What do you got? You got what Paul says is a false brethren, a false convert. Someone who's a fake and a fraud, trying to sneak in and pretend like they're one of us. Buried with him in baptism. Wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of our Lord our God, who hath raised him from the dead. It's a living Savior we worship. It's the living word. 1 Timothy 4.10 For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. Especially of those that believe. He's the Savior of all men. I, ser this, I don't want to get into another song because we're already doing a song, but I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that He is living, whatever men may say. It talks about having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. He's helping me to walk with Him. Walk is an action. When we ask you how your walk with the Lord is, we're not asking about your feelings. We're asking about your life. How much does this book line up with your life? Your walk. Remember what I said, him being commander-in-chief? 
stick to the narrow path. Oh, but this seems cooler over here, and that's funner over there. And oh, but the stick to the narrow path. That's the command. Onward. How's your walk with the Lord? Are you still on that narrow path? We serve a living Savior. The Holy Spirit is in us. Okay, God is with us. Jesus is with us. He is in us. 24-7. Is that biblical? That there is a living, capital W, Word? Absolutely. Jesus Christ. Was there a living Word in the Old Testament? Absolutely. He wasn't known as Jesus Christ back then. Back then, like I said, He was known as the Angel of the Lord or an angel of the Lord, or that man, okay, we did a study on that, that man, talking about um, Samson's parents before Samson was born. That man, he says, I am. And afterwards, like, we've seen God, we're going to die. If God wanted to kill us, see, God the Father has been dealing with mankind through his capital W word and through his lowercase w word. One well, of these days we might get back to the to the marker board so we can do a study on it to be more visual. But capital W word and lowercase w word. Capital W word, Son of God. Lowercase w word, through the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God. God is a spirit. Spirit of God. It shows connection both ways. God is a spirit, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God. The Spirit of God. It's connection. It shows connection both ways. They're one. So hopefully this has helped you and encouraged you, brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, this is just part one. It's the first stanza. I'm going to try to put together the next stanza in the next week. And i got some other studies I'm, I'm working on, brothers and sisters Christ. But brothers and sisters Christ, this is what matters in your life. This is the most prized, precious thing that you have in your, in your whole life. Physical possession. The King James Bible. And it's not enough to have this set in there. Because I know a lot of people that have it set in there, it's gathering dust. It needs to be read. It needs to be heard. It needs to be spoken. Okay? And it needs to be hidden in your heart, and you need to be living it. Grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. I'm praying for you. Please pray for me and my love for you, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.